Well, good afternoon, everyone, or well, good morning to all of you joining us from wherever you are. This is Euraxis Worldwide ASEAN, and thank you for joining us for today's Meet My Lab session. Uh, my name is Susanna Ranzovaso, and together with my colleague Jenny El Marco, we are the representatives of the Euraxis Worldwide Network here in Southeast Asia. And our job is to keep you as researchers in Southeast Asia connected with your counterparts across Europe and in fact, across the world. We have created this platform called Meet My Lab last year in view of the current restrictions we're all facing due to the pandemic that we cannot meet physically, we cannot exchange ideas physically. So we have created this platform to give you an opportunity to learn from each other, to connect with each other and to exchange ideas. And I'm very excited about the session that we are hosting today, which is called Mathematics and Music, a Synergetic Duo for Automatic Music Generation. And I can tell you there's going to be some piano playing involved. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Before I hand over to our moderator for today's session, Dr. Lance Weiss, just a few words about housekeeping. Uh, please do keep your cameras and your microphones switched off for the time being. We will hear from our two presenters, first of all, and thereafter we will open the floor for discussions. You will have the opportunity to engage with our presenters, to ask questions, to make suggestions. So please send us a uh, short note in the chat box, in the question box, indicating the question you would like to ask. And we will then uh, invite you to open your camera and your mic to ask your question during the Q&A session. So I think without further ado, let me just introduce you to our moderator today. Our moderator is Dr. Lance Weiss. He is Associate Professor at the Department of Communications and New Media here in Singapore at uh, the National University of Singapore. Dr. Weiss holds a PhD uh, in visual and auditory neural networks, which he obtained from Boston University uh, in the US. At NUS, he teaches in the area of interactive media design theory and the analysis um, and analysis, apologies, here at the Department of Communications and uh, New Media. He also has an appointment with the Interactive and Digital Media Institute at NUS, where he directs the Arts and Creativity Lab. Dr. Wise also serves on the editorial boards of Computer, the Computer Music Journal, which is published by MIT Press, and also Organized Sound, which is published by Cambridge University Press, as well as the International Journal of Performance Arts and Digital Mu uh, Media. He is uh, best suited to be our moderator today because his research, of course, is closely aligned to that of our presenters. His focus is on live collaborative and distributed musical communication and deep learning neural network models for, for sound design. And his research interest is in theoretical and computational techniques for the creation and analysis of interactive media, particularly sonic arts. So with this, I think I'll just hand over to Lance to introduce our speakers um, to all of you. And I wish you all a very fruitful and engaging session. Thank you, Lance. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, and thank you for hosting uh, this exciting uh, meeting. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, moderate and to uh, introduce my two colleagues and indeed friends. Um, all of us have something in common, and that is that we have degrees in something other than music, but have managed to uh, work in our love of uh, music in our uh, research and uh, performance practices, depending on who we're speaking with here. So uh, I'll first introduce Dorian. Dorian Harrimans is an assistant professor at Singapore University of Technology and Design. She's also the director of the game lab there. Before joining SUTD, she was the Marie Sladowska Curie Postdoctoral Fellow at the Center for Digital Music at Queen Mary University in London, where she worked on the project Morpheus Hybrid Machine Learning 
optimization techniques to generate structured music through morphing and fusion. She received her PhD in applied economics and graduated as a business engineer in management information systems at the University of Antwerp in 2005. After that, she worked as a consultant and as an IT lecturer at Les Roche University in Bluch, Switzerland. Dr. Herrmann's research interests include AI for novel applications such as music and audio. Her fellow uh, presenter and uh, engager in this wonderful dialogue is Elaine Chu. Elaine Chu is an operations researcher and pianist. Uh, she's a senior CNRS researcher at the STMS lab at IRCOM in Paris and a visiting professor at the engineering of engineering at King's College in London right now. She's a principal investigator of several projects uh, that include both music and uh, some scientific endeavors. Uh, one of them is called heart.fm and I expect she'll probably mention a word or two about that when she talks. Her work has been recognized and she's uh, uh, really been awarded some fantastic uh, recognition, uh, fellowships at Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, for example. And uh, she, let's see, she received a PhD from, in operations research at MIT, uh, a BAS in mathematical and computational science at, uh, and music uh, with distinction at Stanford. So a music degree did get in there somehow which I'm not surprised because I've heard her perform and play. So um, she has diplomas in piano performance with Trinity College in London. She was a professor of digital media at Queen's Mary's uh, University of London, uh, assistant and then tenured associate professor at USC, University of Southern California uh, in the early 2000s, where she held the inaugural, the inaugural Viterbi early career chair and was visiting professor at Harvard in 2008, 2009 and Lehigh in 2000 and 2001. So with those introductions, I'm gonna turn it over uh, and we'll see a couple of presentations of about 20 minutes each, and then we'll uh, make it more interactive and uh, have some conversation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Lance. I'll just... Uh start by talking a little bit about some of the work that Elena and I did together during uh, my Marie Curie Fellowship. Uh, after that, Elaine will demonstrate some of the, uh, the, the music that we generated in this project so that our models produced. Uh, and Elaine will talk a little bit about her lab, what her lab is currently doing, and after which I'll talk about what my lab is currently doing. So perhaps to give a little bit uh, of background, Lance already mentioned uh, a lot of my career track. I started in uh, Belgium where I became a business engineer and sort of gradually moved towards the space of music because indeed I found that you cannot just use optimization techniques to do you know, a supply chain scheduling. You can actually use them to compose music. And I thought that was very uh, cool and novel thing to do at the time. And I still think it's very interesting. So I hope to introduce you a little bit more to how something like this uh, works and what are the current challenges in the field. Now, before talking about the research, I want to set the stage a little bit and uh, talk about when people first started thinking about, hey, we can create music algorithmically or with a computer. And some of you might be familiar with concepts such as uh, the musical dice game, which people often attribute to Mozart. It's actually due to the composer Kernberger. So Kernberger uh, invented this game whereby you roll a dice and then based on the number you, you roll with the dice, you choose which bar you're going to play uh, next. So the composer supplies a, a sheet with numbered bars and then the order and the song or the piece is determined as you roll these dice. Another hundred years later, we run into this famous lady, Ada Lovelace, who's often considered to be the world's first programmer because she worked with Charles Babbage on the difference engine and the analytical engine, which is basically the first programmable computer uh, although be it steam powered, so a little bit different than the computers we have now. So Ida, when she wrote the notes on how to program this engine, she wrote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So back 
back then, before there were really computers, the idea that perhaps music is made in such a way that we can scientifically uh, or statistically create pieces of music. It wasn't another hundred years about later that an actual computer much more like we know it today was created, uh, the Ilya computer, which is uh, often seen as the first successful computer. It's still a bit different. You had to program it using patch cables, but still using this computer, Hiller and Isaacson composed what is often considered the world's first computer generated piece of music using some rules, using simple statistical models like Markov models, uh, they created uh, a string quartet called the Iliac Suite. In the interest of time, I won't play it for you, but you can look it up on YouTube very easily. Ever since then, there's been a lot of research happening in this field. From the 80s to 2010, about there's a lot of people experimenting with genetic algorithms, optimization, Markov models, rule-based models, and others. Um, but it, it wasn't until, let's say, the last few years that this field has really exploded and gained popular attention. I think it's partly due to the effectiveness of deep, deep neural network techniques and companies like Google with their Magenta project that, uh, or their Bach doodle that, that, you know, gained some news attention. Personally, I think that the future lies in combining these last two methods uh, integrating some musical knowledge into how we create these deep networks so that we can really solve the last few challenges in this field. So if Google is generating music, are we done then? I'd say no, because while we can go to a blog and follow some snippet of code that lets us generate music using a deep neural network, what this often provides is music that sounds really good if you listen to it for, let's say, 10 seconds. But what makes some music successful is that it has uh, the ability to generate earworms, so a theme or a pattern that sticks to your mind. And that kind of long-term structure is still absent. Secondly, music, uh, sorry, emotion and computers have a very difficult relationship. Right. Models and algorithms still struggle a lot to really capture emotion. And as we all know, we listen to, to music often related to certain emotions that we're experiencing. You just had a bad breakup, you listen to music to cheer you up, or you're angry and you listen to music to vent. And we wanted to examine this, these relationships. So when, when Elaine and I wrote the Morpheus project proposal, we, we specifically wanted to tackle uh, how we can generate music according to a specific emotion, or what we did use, it was tension, and how, secondly, how we can create a long-term structure in the generated music. Right, so I'll just briefly go over how we tackle these two challenges. First, emotion. So we decided we'll look at tonal tension, which may reflect the, the tenseness or that kind of emotion in music. And Prof. Elaine Chu has created the spiral array, which is a 3D geometrical and mathematical model of tonality. I, I believe it, it started in her PhD. And this, this model of tonality allows us to basically create a spatial representation of pitches, chords, and keys. So each of these three elements will have a, a helix in the spiral array. And based on this, we've defined three measures of tension. Uh, I list them there, Clyde diameter, Clyde momentum, and tensile strain. And I'll, I'll briefly walk you through these uh, three elements. So if you, for anyone interested, perhaps Elaine will tell you, but there's a very cool app that was released recently, MuseArt. And you can actually on your phone visualize it, the spiral array as you play. It's, it's pretty nice. Okay, so the first measure that we defined was cloud diameter. If we're playing a chord or some notes, we can visualize them in the array. Here on the left, we see a C major chord and on the right, a C diminished. So what we can see is that the C diminished, which is a much more tense chord, is way more stretched out in this array. So that gives us an, if we measure this cloud diameter, this is one of the me measures of tensions that we will use. Secondly, we can see how much movement there is in the array. 
If I go from a C major chord to a C sharp major, they both have C in the name, but they're quite different chords. We see a large movement in the array. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but from the C chord here, C, E, D, the center of this chord is quite a long way up until the C sharp chord, which is all the way here. So keeping track of how much movement there is in the array allows us to measure a different type of tension. Finally, we have tensile strain. So Elaine's spiral array not just positions notes or pitches in this space, we also have positions for each key. So that means from any given chord or group of notes, we can measure the distance between the chord and how close they are to a certain key. In this case, we have a C chord here on the right, uh, which is very close to the C major key, as you would expect. The A minor chord here is also very close to the C major key, as you also might expect, because C major and A minor are you know, uh, related keys. And the C sharp major key, uh, sorry, the C sharp major chord here is quite far away from the key. So again, this gives us an indication of how, how not matching the chord is to the current key of the song. Here's an example. Some of you might have heard about the Tristan chord, which is a famous tense chord. It comes from the opera uh, Tristan and Isolde from Wagner. And uh, basically every time the Tristan character enters the stage, we hear this chord in the background music. And that's sort of done deliberately to create a feeling of tension to get related to this character. Um, I have visualized the three metrics that we propose here on the, in, in the drawing. And we see that they both, they, they all three, they explode just when the Tristan chord is played, which is sort of in the middle, uh, in the start of the third bar. Um, this makes sense because if we look at the Tristan chord in the spiral array, we see that it's all stretched out. So our metrics accurately capture the tense, tenseness in this chord. Let me play this fragment for you. So uh, with this tool, we can measure tension, which is a first step to generating music with tension. Now, secondly, we needed a way to constrain these repeated patterns in generated music. And we looked at uh, a compression algorithm, Kozaitek from Prof. David Meredith. And Kozaitek is works much like zip compression. If you're familiar with zip files, it finds repeated strings. So if we represent music in this particular Point, dot, point set representation, we can actually find repeated fragments, such as the red line here is the melody, the top left, that's repeated in the second voice in the second bar. Uh, I'll play this for you too, and you keep an eye on the descending pattern and the red pattern. with two powerful tools, uh, we can measure tension and we can detect patterns. So what we do with Morpheus is we take a template piece. Uh, we want to morph this piece and change it. We, up from this template piece, we first calculate the patterns, so the repeated patterns. And we will use these patterns to hard constrain our, uh, our new generated piece. So we delete all the pitches from the original piece. We keep the rhythm for now. And we use an optimization method to generate new pitches that have a tension profile as you desire, or that are matched to the original tension of the original piece. Okay. So this is an, a simple, well, simple uh, combinatorial optimization problem. So we're deciding on which pitches to play at any given point, trying to minimize the total, the tension with our desired tension. And as a heart constraint, we make sure that in the original piece, whenever a pattern occurred, a pattern occurs in the same place as the original pattern was repeated. 
what the actual pattern is can be totally different because we're generating new pitches. That's sort of the gist of the Morpheus uh, system. I will leave it to Prof. Elaine to give a few demos of the resulting music. So Elaine, if, if you're ready, <laughs> are you still muted? Okay, um, I, I would like to share my screen, um, so I will do that. Okay, so um, I'm going to show a few things. One is sort of the results of Morpheus iterating through the algorithm. Uh, sequences of the iterations of the compositions that are generated, then I will um, show one example from the little notebook of Anna Magdalena Bach, uh, for Anna Magdalena Bach by J.S. Bach, and uh, finish with uh, an example from uh, that is uh, learned from Beethoven's Fur Elise. Uh, I know that Doreen just now mentioned MuseArt, so I'll just flash a slide to show uh, MuseArt, and this is where you can get it, an interactive app, and if um, there's an augmented reality version of it now, so you can download it from the App Store and play with it, and it takes audio input, not just MIDI. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Morpheus copying PDQ Bach. The original PDQ Bach sounds like this. And it's trying to be like Okay, so this is the PDQ Bach version of uh, the prelude in C. And this is Morpheus' first attempt at trying to copy that. Um, it, we're going to play it on that piano because I don't want to learn this, it's too hard. That was just the right hand, we'll do it now with the left hand. <laughs> After iterating a bit and not quite optimal yet, we get this, oops, sorry, this next one. <laughs> Slightly better as sounding, it's approaching optimal. And now we have a much closer to optimal version coming up next. In, in case you can't see, the keys are actually moving. Uh, we're actually triggering it from the MIDI file and that piano is playing back the, uh, the piece. Okay. Um, this is uh, Morpheus, uh, Morpheus um, imitating uh, the minuet in G, and the original minuet sounds like this. And now, uh, this is Morpheus' version of that. Okay, so this is how uh, we get from uh, a template piece to an example output uh, that is playable. Um, and the latest creation by Morpheus, this being um, a year of celebrating 250 years of Be since Beethoven's birth. It was supposed to be last year, but it was a difficult pandemic year. So many concerts got postponed to this year. And this year is now the 251st uh, anniversary of uh, Beethoven's birth. 
Uh, and this is Fur Elise. Uh, everyone knows the original Fur Elise. This is how it goes. And this is the start. This is how uh, Morphia starts. I don't want to have to play that. So, <laughs> and this is the uh, this is the output that we ended with uh, for the fur Elise. So this is the beginning of the piece, and I actually learned this. So I will play you the fur Elise. Uh, it's about uh, three, a little over three minutes. Uh, so I'm going to start on this one now. Oh, by the way. Um, the pieces generated by Morpheus are a little bit more difficult than the original, so they take a bit of time to learn. Thank you. 
So that's the Morpheus for Elise. And um, oh, with that, I was going to tell you a bit about uh, the current projects that um, uh, together with my research uh, team and collaborators we are working on. And I will try to do that uh, in maybe uh, five minutes. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, just real quick, uh, I am at the STMS lab at AirCam, which is Sciences and Technologies of Music and Sound. We're about two stories underground um, beneath the Stravinsky fountain. And I lead two projects here, Cosmos and Heart FM. Uh, they are funded by the European Research Council. And uh, Cosmos looks at uh, performance data as well as uh, cardiac data. And we use uh, data science and citizen science as well as optimization techniques to, um, to, to uh, study um, these uh, data streams. And Heart FM, well, we're looking at physiological data in response to music and uh, in treatments for uh, hypertension. So uh, a lot of our work now is, um, does uh, touches on uh, cardiac data. So just real quick, uh, card, uh, the heart beats um, in a heartbeat. Uh, the heartbeat starts from the sinus node and impulse from the sinus node. And um, so the impulse goes through the top chambers, the top chambers beat, and then it goes uh, through the uh, atrial ventricular node and uh, triggers another, uh, uh, the, the bottom chambers um, contract with that second trigger. And so um, this is an example of um, what happens when um, a heart is not beating uh, regularly. Uh, this is an example uh, that's taken from atrial fibrillation. So this is related to Morpheus uh, because we are actually going to copy this rhythm and uh, we're going to play uh, a piece of music that is generated that copies entirely the rhythm. Uh, and there's a whole series of uh, little piano etudes. If you're interested, uh, you can look at it, a little etudes video uh, uh, on YouTube uh, that does many different arrhythmias and has pieces composed based on the arrhythmias. Um, related to this uh, is some recent work uh, by Emma Frid uh, looking at um, a heart transplant COVID patient and the medical team working with the patient and uh, looking at the coherence between the heart signals of the medical team that's supporting the patient. And um, this is a sonification of that coherence uh, that is linked to the tension model that uh, Doreen spoke about. I think I did not share my sound, did I? I will have to this time reshare this and with share sound. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, this you get an idea of how the different hearts are um, playing together. Um, more, um, much of our recent work also focuses on performed music. So um, you can, uh, there is a very nice video that the CNRS has made um, about this project, and this is online. It's called uh, Le Piano Virtuos, uh, and you can down, um, watch it on YouTube. So I leave the link here, and uh, we're not going to watch it now. And uh, as part of that project, we're using citizen science to encourage people to help us understand performances uh, because humans are able to hear many of the structures that are projected in performances that computers don't know how to extract yet. And um, we will be sending out a link uh, that uh, 
uh, Suzanne has kindly agreed to help share uh, later on some information about the citizen science project, and I hope that um, many of you will participate and uh, join in in the citizen science effort. Uh, finally, uh, these are the wonderful people I get to work with. Uh, that's the research team and um, collaborators at uh, uh, um, the research team at IRCAM and the collaborators at the Bart's Heart Center and UCL. And if you would like to have more information, here's uh, a link to our blog. And um, let's see. If there's time at the end, I can show you uh, a quick demo of, uh, is there time to do a quick demo? I can leave it to the end. Um, I think we have time now. If you would oh, like okay, to let me do that then. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and I'll share the, the Cosmos, um, the Cosmo notes screen. Actually, let me sh share that screen as I log in because I will log in with uh, something that all of you would be able to use also. Apologies, I forgot to share sound. Okay. All right, here we go. Here we're going to, uh, this is Cosmonote, so cosmonote.earcam.fr. And right now, eventually, all of you will be able to create your own accounts. Uh, but right now, I'm just going to log in <clears throat> as Euro Access um, 2021. And the password is citizen science all one word, all small and lowercase, exclamation mark. Let's see. And this is the Beethoven for Elise. And um, as you can see, this is a visualization of the fur Elise uh, from data that was captured on this piano here. Uh, that's MIDI and audio captured synchronously. And uh, you can see the notes. You can turn them off. You can see the notes. Uh, you can see the pedals. Uh, oh, the pedals, I'm not showing. Or, and you can see the loudness and uh, the tempo. And um, what we're interested in are things that you can hear in a performance, not necessarily the, uh, uh, the perform uh, the composed structures, but more um, the kinds of structures that are projected in performance. End of a phrase. But you can mark boundaries of different strengths that are projected in the performance. And um, you would be able to also mark out regions and notes that are important in the music. Uh, this particular... Ooh. That's strange. 
Okay. And this is, no, I do not want to uh, save my changes. <laughs> this is the Morpheus for Elise. With some structures already marked. Okay, so uh, we hope that you will um, log into this and play with the structures. And um, that's the end of the demo of uh, Cosmo Notes. And you will be receiving um, a message with uh, more information about how to interact with Cosmo Notes. And uh, the person who will be sending that message is right behind me here. And I'd like to introduce him. This is Daniel Badoya. Uh, he's a doctoral student working on Cosmonote and on the citizen science uh, studies in particular. All right. And with that, I'll pass it back to Doreen. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Right, so thanks for the demo of Morpheus. It's always a, a lot nicer when somebody actually can play uh, the sounds. Uh, in uh, contrast, some of the work that we're doing right now in the lab that I'll talk about very briefly uh, will allow to be MIDI sounds, so they might pale in comparison. So uh, at SUTD here in Singapore, uh, I have a lab, some PhD students, postdoc, and uh, master's students. We're working on AI for audio and music. So we're working a lot on music generation, but we also have some other projects going like uh, audio transcription. Uh, we do cough sound classification um, uh, and some other work. For instance, we also have the NN audio library that allows you to extract spectrograms on the fly using neural network technologies, which is great for training networks very fast. Uh, but what I want to talk about very briefly now is some of the other music generation work that we have been doing. So because I mentioned before, there is some uh, research that works quite well on music generation, there still are some challenges remaining like emotion and these long-term structures. So what we really want to focus on in our labs and how we can control and steer the generation as it's happening. So imagine yourself much like a producer, your you know, sliding sliders and, and the generated music changes on your behalf. So you become sort of like a meta composer, right? So we con continued on the work of Morpheus and also we worked with these tension models and we went to see, uh, this is together with Regu who's an intern, uh, came to visit us in Singapore for a while. He's at the University of Sussex. And uh, Rego developed a variational autoencoder that can actually predict which tension the music is producing. So that sort of allows us or allows the network to learn a representation that encodes this tension uh, implicitly. So that in turn also allows us to change these latent variables, this representation learned by the network and hence change the resulting uh, tension in the music. So we worked with uh, pop music here, melody and bass, and this is the LAC MIDI data set for those interested. And basically I'll, I'll show you a very simple example. So we have some original generated music here, quite neutral. So what we did is we did this transformation uh, in these latent variables for those familiar with neural networks and we could make the tension higher. It can sometimes be subtle to hear, uh, but in general, we did a listening test and we found that the responses were quite in, in line with our, our model. Uh, here we have uh, another step further. 
where we thought about the same principles as using musical sliders, but this time we want to use the sliders as a higher level uh, control aspect. So the sliders would, for instance, be um, arousal and lower level attributes could be uh, note density, rhythmic density, which are features related to arousal or the amount of energy in the music. So we made a quite complex network here uh, based on the FaderNets model. And this model can consists of three structures, really. We have a, a reconstruction model, which is quite standard for autoencoders. So we try to reconstruct the model and we force it through a small representation. We also have a discriminator model. So we use the latent variables here to predict uh, low level attributes like rhythmic and node density. And a third quite interesting model here, we use these same latent variables to predict high level attributes like arousal. Um, and this is interesting because there are very few data sets with labeled arousal data. So what we did really is um, uh, we used semi-supervised learning for this. So we leveraged the discriminator model to train the cluster uh, module. And the result is quite promising. And it really shows if we sort of visualize with the TSME our latent variables, we see that they're actually different representations that are easily separable for different musical attributes. Now, the key to why we're doing this is we want deep neural networks to be able to learn these specific musical properties so we can move away from uh, rule-based models uh, because we're encoding the rules in the neural network. And here's some examples. So if we have any musical piece, such as this one, So we can just feed it through this network and the result will be, for instance, here we have a higher arousal version of the same song. So it's pretty much the same song, so it keeps the properties of the original song, but it changes the energy of the song. Right. So um, in the last few projects, uh, we turned to some of the very popular networks, which are transformers. And instead of just examining arousal and tension, we really focused on valence, which is the positivity or negativity of generated music. And we used this popular sequence to sequence architecture, which uh, are inspired on machine translation tasks. So what happens in machine translation, we have English text, we translate into French text. For instance, what we want to do is we want to feed it control parameters like valence, time signature, grouping indications, is it a new musical sentence or not? And we want to translate all of these conditions into an actual song, chords and melody. And, and so we, we used a plain vanilla uh, architecture, a vanilla transformer architecture, but the unique thing is the way that we represent our events. So the input events would be uh, low valence, uh, medium density, et cetera, all musical parameters, they're translated into a melody with chords. Here's an example output. I don't want to linger on this too long because I know this is a long session. Uh, but again, in a user listening experiment, we found that all of the people rated the level of valence the same as we intended to when we uh, were generating this, which is quite remarkable. Um, we also compared this to other architectures like LSTM, and we found that in the musical terms, we generate quite sound music. Of course, this is pop songs, so lead sheets. We have melody and chords. At the moment, we're working towards adding drums and bass in this. And we finally, in our project, want to connect this to video emotions. So if a user inputs a video, we predict the valence, and then we generate accompanying music for the video. That's the end goal of our project that we're doing here. Uh, a very last uh, project is uh, our hierarchical RNN project. So I talked a lot about emotion, 
we also want to make sure that this long-term structure is in our music. And with Morpheus, we are fortunate to use optimization techniques. So we start from random notes and we just heart constrain these patterns. But in neural networks, that's not really easy to do. So one thing we recently experiment with is uh, something based on the sample RNN network, which is often used in audio. Now, when we generate music, you usually work with MIDI, which is a very different type of information. But we use the same hierarchical structure that takes input in different time frames. So we basically, in our neural network, we take a time frame in the node level. We also have one in the bar level and a bigger time frame as well. So this allows, hopefully, the network to understand that it needs to look back in different levels to see different types of patterns. And we used the Kozayatek algorithm that we used to extract the patterns in Morpheus, and we looked at the compression ratio, which basically indicates how much repeated patterns there are. And we found that when we generate uh, with this hierarchical RNN, our compression is, ratio is very high, especially compared to other state-of-the-art networks like attention RNN. So that's quite promising. And we hope to integrate all of these models into one great uh, music generation project. Um, as a final note, I, I'll just play some of this hierarchical RNN music. Since this is about melodic repetition, uh, we generate in many different genres. I figured I'd take a, an electronic dance music song, which is a nice outro for this uh, talk, I think, uh, because in dance music, especially, repetition is ever so important. Right, so this is uh, what I wanted to share about my research. Uh, I think both me and Elaine have a research lab website. So if you want to learn more about us, you can always look us up on the internet. And of course, we'll be here to answer your questions. Are you still muted, Lance? Thank you very much uh, to both of our speakers. Um, so, you know, I have about 50 questions that have come up as I watch this, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and resist the urge to ask them. Uh, I can see uh, both of you uh, personally at another time. Oh, and so we'll open it up to uh, some of the uh, questions from uh, the audience. So Amal raised a hand early on in the, in the talks. So why don't we uh, go to Amal first. Amal, please uh, turn on your audio and your video and uh, just introduce yourself uh, in a sentence and then uh, go ahead and ask your question. Amal, are you there? Do you wanna uh, ask your question? Okay, let's, let's move on to another question uh, from uh, Loneza Calbanel. Loneza, can you uh, go ahead and flip your video and audio on and ask your question? While the technical folks that support us at your access are working on, on this issue, um, I will go ahead and ask the question. And so I, I have one for both of you and it's, it's one that it's a question that you might uh, hate, and I hope I'm not asking it in the sort of typical naive way. So what I want to get at is when you're doing this research, um, how are you thinking about the uh, some of the end goals, right? Um, of course, we maybe we're just trying to put musicians out of business, or maybe we want things so we can relieve effort, or more seriously, uh, to have uh, partners that compose. Uh, with us, or I can think of other options too, like maybe we're trying to understand written music better so that our research in trying to imitate music is a way to understand the musical capability of human beings, or, 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 or. So um, I, I, I missed some of the context uh, from both of you that would, I think, help understand, um, you know, the whys of generative music. Uh, and some of the issues that you're, uh, the questions that you're addressing in your research. Uh, 
Elaine, do you want to go ahead or? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Um, as as a musician, I, I I don't see this as an effort to put musicians out of business. Um, it's and at the moment, these systems are so far from what musicians can do and composers um, can do that um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not replicating that skill, it's, it's not. Um, and what, what we are hoping to be able to do is to understand music better, to understand humans better, to understand uh, what it means to create and make better music. Um, and in understanding this, maybe we can find new ways or paths that have not been tried before. And uh, the idea is that it would um, perhaps be a way to assist us to break out of our um, well-trodden paths and uh, to be able to uh, find new ways of expression. Good. Dorian, do you, do you have a... Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Elaine. Like, in a way, these systems, well, they're... They're artists in a way, right? They're not going to replace all the music that there is. Um, but they certainly are not uh, complete yet or finished yet. But that's also not the point. I think, for instance, when you're creating a website, you don't start with uh, doc type equals you know, HTML. You take a template. And the template helps you and empowers you to do things. And I think part of this is that imagine you're a music composer. Uh, you need to create something that matches a film, you're a film music composer. You, you go to your DAW and you, you sort of have the overall intensity of the movie there and you say, well, okay, generate me some chords that might match this and then I'll change them and add the melody. It's sort of tools to empower composers is one of the, the, the applications I can see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. So uh, thank you. Uh, so I ha we do have uh, a question uh, from uh, Loneza and Loneza, I think you're ready to turn on your uh, mic and video and ask your question. Well, I think I saw her just a minute ago. <laughs> okay, while we still try to set that one up, I'm going to move to a question that's been typed in, and it's anonymous. And the question is, how did you both uh, start in the field? And I think that's a reasonable question that I hear a lot from uh, students who might have some musical loves and some technical chops that they're developing in their schools. And they're wondering how the heck people like you uh, put those together and, and how did you, what was happening there at the beginning when you started to make those connections? All right, so for me, um, when I was about 23 and I was about to graduate in applied economics, I needed to choose a master thesis title. And there was a list of suggested topics and I was sort of at the time not ready to become a consultant at an, you know, a big business company. And one of the topics was music and meta heuristics. And I was like, I don't know what meta heuristics are, but I want to do the thing with music. <laughs> so that's really how I got into it. And the advisor of the thesis ended up being my PhD thesis like uh, six years later. So. Elaine, how about you? Well, for me, it was, um, I, I was a musician and I come from a, a family of mathematicians. So I always did the two uh, in tandem. And um, it didn't occur to me to combine the two of them until quite late. I, I was halfway through my PhD and, um, and I met uh, Jean Bamberger, who, who's one of uh, the early uh, pioneers in the field in music and AI. And she pointed me to some literature, some papers that had been written. Um, and uh, that got me going, it got me thinking. I was like, oh, wow, I could combine the two and, and I can advance and go beyond what these papers are doing. 
And um, at that point, I decided that was what I wanted to do. So I actually abandoned what I'd been doing before that. And it was a big leap of faith to jump into this area combining mathematics and music. I'm a bit older than Doreen. So at that time, this was not a field that actually, you know, you could graduate in and expect to find a job in. Um, so it, it was it was quite a risk, um, but it was what, um, when I discovered that I could combine mathematics and music, I could see myself doing this uh, as my career for, for you know, for the rest of my life, I could see that sort of unfolding. And, and so that was what I, what I did. Yeah. It wasn't easy after that. I mean, there were other challenges to overcome, uh, but that was how it got started. I think um, to, just to follow up on that question, uh, the, when we go into interdisciplinary work that doesn't fit into a field where there are no departments in the universities already right. and that sort of thing, there really is an extra a challenge. And that challenge follows us through our lives, uh, which journals to publish in, how to get recognition within an institution. Uh, there's all kinds of questions that come up uh, that you know, we, we make light of. Well, of course, I love mathematics, I love music, we put them together, but uh, there's a real life aspect to it, which uh, uh, does have its challenges. Real implications. That's right. Um, Loneza. Are you there and available to ask your question? I'm gonna to go to uh, another question. And that is, I'm reading off the uh, chat window. Does your research include developing an AI to capture the emotional expression of a certain artist to be encoded uh, into MIDI? So I guess the question really is, can you, instead of just styles, can you capture information about particular artists? I think that's what we're getting at here. Yeah, you can sort of see the question. There's many aspects here in this question. Um, first of all, there's individual composer styles. I did some research on a classification model per composer. That, that certainly is possible, but that wasn't related to emotion. So we are uh, gathering data sets and training models to predict emotion from music videos. So looking at both the music, the muted video and together, which is quite interesting. It turns out that the video is not at all that important. It's mostly the audio, uh, but that is waveforms. So it's not the MIDI. There's only one MIDI data set that I know of that has emotion. So it's very hard to train a, a data set on that, a model on that. Um, I'll jump in. I, I see the words emotional expression next to each other. So um, when, in my experience, when people talk about music and expression, uh, there's often a confusion between the expressivity of the music and the emotions. So the expressivity is actually what um, the performer or the musician conveys uh, when communicating the music. And the emotion is what the listener experiences or perceives in the music as uh, conveying a state of emotion. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe this question refers to the expressivity of the, uh, as Lance points out, the expressivity of, the, uh, of a particular artist. Um, uh, one can build models to do that, and if, if that's a goal. Um, and uh, it, it depends what, what the aim is. Um, it depends what, uh, what one wishes to achieve with uh, modeling an artist, um, uh, whether you want to be able to synthesize uh, things and that's uh, new music, uh, new, new uh, uh, musical expressions in that artist style, or um, uh, which may be interesting. Uh, I, um, the current uh, problems we're trying to tackle are to enable people to be expressive themselves and to explore their own expressivity. An interesting um, thing that I learned as I was studying a little bit along these lines too, uh, there was a study about uh, machines learning to understand whether or not Amazon reviews of pro products were positive or negative. And it turns out that um, well, I mean, if there are statistical regularities there with enough data, they can be 
learned. The machine doesn't have to have emotion or know anything about emotion in order to pick up on the, the types of manifestations of what those things are, what's correlated with a positive review and what's correlated with a negative. But sure enough, it had a very particular and identifiable set of nodes in that network that were responding uh, and could, could be pointed to as the emotional, the positive or the negative valence in the, in the review. Uh, so that the machine developed its own representation of emotion without even being actually trained on emotion. And uh, by, just because there was regularity there and it found it to be a handy representation in order to generate new reviews that had a particular emotion. So, so I, I, it's, it's interesting how those machines, uh, even as if you look at them as just correlation machines, um, can find things that are surprising and interesting uh, given the kinds of data that we looked at in theater. There's an interesting question that, that's coming up here about animals. I'm not sure exactly how to interpret it, so I'll read it. We know that even animals have emotions, my thought is. Is it also possible that the project can include, you know, musical patterns among animal emotions? Can the machines I, I'd invite the typer of that question to give a little bit more information. Are you wondering if, if animal emotional uh, behavior can be translated into music that has emotions in some way, or that we can somehow make animals into musical expressive beings by understanding their patterns? It's not clear exactly what you, you mean. Uh, so I'll let you type on that a little more as as, okay. Right, so I'll invite the, that typer to go ahead and, 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 and elaborate on that one. Another question comes up for Professor Elaine. Has your mathematical work here impacted the way you think about music um, as you prepare to play a piece of conventional music? Okay. I. I that's a good question and uh, thank you for asking it um in in my mind uh in my mathematical work i'm trying to use mathematics to express what i know about music um, i'm trying to externalize what's in my head already about the music um if i start with a mathematical model and i try to impose it on how I approach music, I haven't found that to be a useful approach yet. Um, it's, I think what, uh, I think what humans do with music is just so vast and so, um, and there's so much to explore that um, just trying to capture what, what there is and, and what we know about music and what we know to do with music uh, is, is for me uh, really fascinating and, and has taken, uh, absorbed a lot of my time and uh, research efforts. So um, when I've looked at what the models have come up with um, and maybe, I guess, Perhaps there is some truth in the fact that the fact that I've tried to ab abstract some of these ideas and to make them systematic or to make them uh, more concrete, uh, I may pay more attention to it the next time I come to the music and be more aware of these uh, perhaps structures I'm trying to find or express um, in mathematical terms. Uh, so in that way, that may change the way that I approach the music, but um, that is not the intent. Uh, and normally, it, the intent is to externalize what, what is known. Um, if, if I may uh, follow up on something that Dorian mentioned in, in, while she was talking about uh, the need to combine some of the more, uh, the models that have come out more in the last 10 years, the deep learning models with some of the more traditional a statistical and also, I guess, AI or, or, or computer science sort of approaches to data representation and generation and that sort of thing. Why, what was it that made you say, hey, I think the, um, uh, we ought to be looking at combinations of these kinds of, of models. What is it that each is missing uh, that the other 
uh, uh, can bring that you feel would be better than uh, either one alone can do? I think it's because I saw uh, students or researchers, purely neural network researchers, trying to tackle music generation, you knowing nothing about music, there were just certain things that they didn't look at, like in terms of evaluating their model or in terms of uh, representation, right? As a musician, you know, for instance, that meter would be important uh, because it determines where, which, you know, a notes on the beat would, might be more influential. And if, if you don't feed that to the neural network, then they don't know it. So if we like encode more new musical knowledge in our networks, then the, the output is just going to be better. So we need to look at it multidisciplinary. And does it make sense to encode certain rules in your loss function or do you, uh, do, do you do other things to combine these? I think that's a real challenge and that's where the next step of process, progress will be made. Okay. Um, I see a question that's more for Elaine here, which is very specific about the, uh, the diameter of the Tristan chord compared to some of these other uh, oh. spellings, A flat minor six or F semi diminished. Uh, do you know offhand about some of the sh shapes of those on the, uh, on the helix, I guess he was asking about, right, he or she? Uh, no, but if you send me um, the chords or you send Doreen the chords, we, we can uh, easily... Or download the app. Uh, oh, yes. Download the app and play with it. <laughs> You'll be able to see it. Uh, I think yeah. the German 6 we visualized before, that had a similar structure. See, um, you guys talked, both of you talked about uh, tension and a few other you know, concepts and uh, valence. Uh, but you, you didn't mention anticipation. And uh, although I know you've both written and thought about that thing, and, and uh, David Huron is often cited in, in your papers, and he's somebody who spent a lot of time thinking about how anticipation works. And we often think about that expectation is one of the driving forces in, in music. And if our expectations are randomly violated, we lose interest or uh, does, does the, how does the notion of anticipation uh, fit into some of the concepts that uh, you talked about uh, today. Could you do you have automatic ways of visualizing that in the same way you do with tension or 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 I mean it seems to me that those things are inevitably tied up together. Uh, putting off something that you're anticipating is a way of heightening tension. It's not just mm -hmm. in the spelling of a chord that results in tension, but something in what might happen and that does or doesn't for example. They're definitely related. And, and it's true, this is an important concept that we didn't mention. Uh, when you listen to music, uh, expectation is a very important. And you don't necessarily always want the thing that's most expected. You want to be surprised as well, which is where the tension comes in. Suppose we haven't, I, I haven't at least put the tension or try to find a correlation between tension and expectation. But in all the statistical models and the deep learning models, uh, the expectation is sort of expressed by the probability of the next note. And since depending on the sampling method, uh, yeah, you, you choose, uh, you could sometimes allow least expected notes. So I did this test once whereby we had a simple Markov model and we chose only the high probability sequences as output. And you just end up in a little loop of three notes because those were the most expected notes. <laughs> well, you know, I was gonna ask Elaine where some of those really high notes came out in the, the for release model, not remembering where they were. I, I just wasn't thinking of them. It sounds, and and uh, they seemed ill-placed and unexpected. Uh, and mm -hmm. I can see why that would make it hard to, to play too. So, <laughs> Although maybe the statistical distribution of the high notes was, was spot on, the, the placement somehow in the flow of the music was sounded more random, right? Well, I, I, I think I'll, I'll, uh, Doreen should jump in if I say anything wrong, but uh, Morpheus does not know about octaves. And so the output comes in this array of things that are occasionally things that are really widespread. And um, when I, uh, so I've been cleaning up the output so that I can read it. I make it, uh, and also the spelling is um, sometimes 
I don't change the notes. I do change the spelling so that in my mind, I can actually conceive of where it's going. Um, but I almost um, consistently choose not to uh, displace the octaves. I keep them where they are. I keep them where they are because it's cool. It's Webern-like. Uh, I like what it's doing. <laughs> well, it is Webern-like and, and it reminded yeah. me of that, but somehow, which would you say is harder to learn? You, you mentioned a few times as you were playing that, that what uh, the model produces is, is harder to learn than a, a piece of written music written by a human, or I, I'm, I'm characterizing what you said. Uh, do you find that that music is for some reason even harder than some of the 12 tone music that seems fairly, I mean, arbitrary and as far as key and expression goes, in some of the composers of mid 20th century. Is, is what your machine is composing even harder to play than the note pieces? It, I don't think it's harder to play. What, what is hard is it's not entirely 12 tone and it's not entirely harmonic. It's somewhere in between, mm -hmm. or it's sometimes this and sometimes that. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it difficult because you have to internalize the expectations or you have to change your expectations of where things are going. And um, speaking of expectations, um, one thing which I haven't uh, um, put together to show yet is that because of the change in expectations, um, the timing of the Morpheus generated piece is very different from the timing of the original piece when, when you play it. So the, the uh, original Fur Elise is very smooth. Da -de -da -de -da -de -da -de -dum. And the uh, Fur Elise by Morpheus is because it's wacky and uh, the, 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 the harmonies are, are strange. You wouldn't play it that smoothly. And, and to play it that, well, you could play it that smoothly, but you miss all the opportunities to create all this tension. Uh, and so, um, it, it's fun. It's fun to hear something entirely different on a very familiar template. And I think that's, that's really um, a, a brilliant idea that, uh, you know, of Doreen's to use these templates to then, uh, to get the structure, you get a sense of where that structure came from. You almost hear the original piece in it, but then it's again, very unfamiliar. Uh, and that tension between the familiar and unfamiliar is, is, is what makes it interesting. Sorry to be so abrupt as we go through these, but I wanna, um, <laughs> we're getting towards the end of our, of our session here. I wanna summarize a couple of the questions that I see here. And it has to do with uh, uh, how good machines are. Do, will they find commercial application uh, you know, AI and machine generated music. Uh, are they good at identifying genres is a related question. I think we're asking, are these things on the verge of, uh, you know, um, uh, reality out there in the commercial world? Um, are they that good? And yeah, why don't I summarize up that and then I'll pull out one more question after you address that before we wrap up. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, I think uh, so a lot of this AI and music stuff is, is being implemented by companies like Spotify, Shazam, all these, these things, right? So that really helps us to validate our research versus even five years ago when this wasn't around. Um, as for music generation, I think there is a great number of music generation startups out there. And some companies like Duke Tech in London recently got bought by Byte dance or TikTok. So are we going to see uh, AI generated music as a background on our uploaded videos? Maybe soon. I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm looking at this last question here that I see. <laughs> it's been asked twice. And it, you know, um, it's something that you've actually addressed already. And it has to do, I think, humans always have this concern. It has to do with you know, jobs being taken over by machines and that sort of thing. But it seems like it has a bit different flavor when we're talking about uh, sort of creativity. And so the question 
is there in front of us, is there some sense in which AI composers can replace whatever that means, uh, human composers? Well, in a sense, the fact that I'm playing Morpheus pieces, um, I am playing an AI piece. Mm -hmm. So Morpheus has replaced a composer in creating these particular pieces, and I've invested time in learning them. Uh, so it has, in a sense, replaced some functions of uh, that uh, purposes that a composer serves. Um, but I think it's an entirely different, um, it, it's, it's not doing the same thing. Um, and I, I think that composers will always find new things to do. I mean, that's what being a composer is. Uh, it's, it's about being creating new ways of uh, um, uh, making music, creating new, new ways of putting together ideas. And, and um, I mean, the creation of Morpheus, that's an act of composition. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't see it as being um, in conflict with a musical creation and the act of creating. Uh, I mean, I've chosen to invest my time in learning some of these pieces because I think they have something to say. Uh, if, if, some, if a human composer has something different to say, I mean, I've invested tons of time learning human composers works. Um, and so it's, it's simply amongst the palette of things we can draw from. Uh, I, I don't see them as competing. I wonder if it can be addressed in a similar way that, in fact, we look at the history of machines and computers in work, say, like farm work, right? Yes, they take over jobs, they move into things that humans used to do, but what it does is redefine what humans do. Humans don't just stop suddenly, whatever it is. Like you say, they find new ways of relating, of creating new meaning out of, out of music and, and, and musical communication or whatever it is, and maybe it's uh, analogous in that sense. Well, there are many things I do in my research in music where I wish an AI would take over the grunt work. You know, so <laughs> um, it's not, um, I mean, there, there are many uses that we can use machines, uh, put machines to. Yeah. Yeah. Dorian, any last words here? Yeah, sort of like Lon said, it, it pushes our boundaries because now maybe our TikTok videos will have all individualized music that matches the video versus the 10 template pieces. And TikTok will still be employing the composers to advise on the music generation algorithms for sure. Uh, in terms of jobs, uh, it's creating research positions in music and AI. In fact, we have one or two <laughs> positions open if you're interested. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm personally not really worried about this. And uh, sorry. <laughs> I think this, uh, this, this is creating a lot of opportunities. I would like to thank both of you. It's always fascinating to hear more about your work and uh, how you think about what you do, the contributions you're making to how we think about music. Thank you both uh, very much. With that, I'll pass it over uh, to our hosts. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion, isn't it? I mean, I wish we could go and on and on. I personally, I'm very interested in music. Uh, was a choir member for a long time, haven't been very good with instruments, but this, uh, this discussion on AI and math and, you know, like having the greats also co-create with, with AI, it's, it's, it's incredible. And I like what, uh, uh, Professor Elaine was uh, was uh, talking about you know that they are not we are not in conflict in creating and uh, as uh, Professor Dorian was saying that you know we can actually you know provide new new jobs and also uh, provide new ways of like imagining things so thank you so much uh, uh, Professor Lons Weiss for um, moderating that incredible discussion we would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this really wonderful um, collaboration. And there was an invitation from Professor Elaine about citizen science. So we will give you more information about that. And we will also give uh, more information about how you can collaborate further. There are two positions that are open, I, I heard. So if you're interested in that, please do keep in touch with your Access ASEAN. Please follow us on our social media accounts. And uh, yeah, use the hashtags that we provided for in the 
chat box, uh, chat box uh, for everyone. So thank you so much again, Professor Dorian Herrimans, Professor Elaine Chu, and Professor Lons Weiss. Everybody inside the chat room, have a very good afternoon. Stay safe. And this is your Access ASEAN logging out. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.